Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. This is for the old folks, okay? You remember the woman that wore the flower sack dress and the straw hat and said, I'm so proud to be here. And I am so proud that you're here. Glad to be with you all this morning. Welcome to our 50th anniversary conference. Uh, we'll hear a little more about the history of, of the chapel and all those things a little later today. We decided to do that after lunch when people are sleepy. And, and so rather that they can have full attention to our speakers this morning, I would just, yes, ma'am, just, I'm delighted to have both piano and organ going this morning. That's terrific. And uh, just so glad to see you. I, I think our speakers for the conference are probably well known, but I will just speak a little bit about their relationship to, uh, to the chapel. So our, our first speaker this morning will be Bob Brown, Bob from Slidell, Louisiana. And we have been friends for almost 40 years and, and in longer than, than you were alive when we, when we first met, I think. Um, almost, almost. Um, and Bob has been a great encouragement to this fellowship all through those years. He and our brother Vernon Schlieff, both in, in New Orleans, were uh, church planters, and Vernon in particular in that regard, and vitally interested in seeing uh, works where believers were built up and encouraged. Of course, Bob has, uh, his, his ministry spans the nation. He's leaving here to go to Iowa tomorrow for, uh, uh, and matter of fact, I was thinking it's international if you count the Bahamas, right? So um, we're, we're just glad to have our dear friend here. And then, then the second speaker uh, after him is our brother Larry Price. Larry and I first met in Roanoke, Virginia, of all places, Fleming Chapel. We were both on our way to a men's uh, Bible study at Greenwood Hills, and uh, we could not understand how all those northerners that were there or westerners who were there were not just dying to drive 20 minutes over to Gettysburg and see where uh, things happened, us two southern boys. Now, Larry now lives in Pennsylvania, I think people know, but five-generation Floridian, but again, a ministry that uh, has been appreciated and appreciated by us and a friendship personally appreciated by me for many, many years. Uh, thank you brother, but things we shared, encouraged all along. Then our brother Jabe, you know from his, his uh, conference ministry and, and video ministry and magazine ministry, and, and the man's more creative than any three people I know. Um, so the first thing, the first one, we first got to be, I think, really friends was down in Needham, Alabama, at the conference at the chapel, and he had driven there in a, about an 89 Caprice Classic. They had, they had, had been, just been re, redesigned, and it looked like an upside-down bathtub, and it, it had all kind of power, and about 9 o'clock after everybody eaten and left, he said, have you seen this car? Would you like to drive it? And so we drove all over the backwoods of Choctaw County for a, a little bit, and, and Anyway, that was the beginning of a real beautiful friendship and relationship, and one I appreciate very, very much. And you'll appreciate their ministry as well. Thank you for being here. And, and we can wholeheartedly, I trust every one of you can say, great is his faithfulness. I'll turn time over to Tim. I want to go. Yeah, trip over there. Thank Very good. So we're going to sing one other hymn, just a couple of housekeeping notes. So after, uh, does anyone uh, need a program? I have a young assistant. If you'll raise your hand, if you need one, I think they were very diligent about passing those out. So if you need one of those, uh, please see Sawyer and he'll be happy to get you one. We have the ladies bathroom straight back and then the men's bathroom. You do a U-turn back there. Uh, so after uh, we sing this song, which some of you may know, it's how good it is. 
for brethren to dwell together in unity. I thought it was a great opening hymn for us this morning. Then we'll have our brother Bob come uh, for the ministry. Uh, when Bob comes for the ministry, anyone who would like to go to Sunday school, uh, see Miss Piper back here. If you're going to go with Miss Piper and uh, have a, a time of learning back there about the, the Lord Jesus. Sabbath school, my bad. That's right. So <laughs> there's a five minute grace period. If you like what you got, you can stay. If you don't, you need to go ahead and go. All right. uh, Larry, you cannot go. You have to stay. All right. But it is so good uh, to have everyone here. I, I love the fact that we ran out of parking spots. That is a good problem to have. So if you would, again, we're going to stand up to sing our hymns today. Uh, oh, how good it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity is the scripture. And this is a, a hymn, I believe, three, 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 three verses and a chorus. Hang on for dear life. All right. Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith and unity, where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love are the fruits of his presence here among us. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out his word till the whole earth sees the Redeemer has come, for he dwells in the presence of his people. Excellent. Verse 2. Oh, how good it is <laughs> on this journey we share to rejoice with the happy and weep with those who mourn. For the weak find strength, the afflicted find grace, when we offer the blessing of belonging. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live at his word. To the whole earth sees the Redeemer has come, for he dwells in the presence of his people. Oh, how good it is to embrace his command, to prefer one another, forgive as he forgives. When we live as one, we all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out his word. Till the whole earth sees the Redeemer has come, for he dwells in the presence of his people. Amen. You may have a seat. So uh, as aforementioned, those of you who are going to Sabbath school, you can go with Miss Piper back there. We are turning our time over to, to Bob. You want me to just turn the TV off or I don't know if we can keep this connected. So I'm just going to turn it off for now. And uh, we'll turn our time over to Mr. Bob to our first session where we've been. Thank you, sir. Now I'm spotting you three minutes. Don't waste it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, good to be here. This is a fun thing for Larry and Jabe and I. Uh, we've all been friends for a long time. Um, the first time I met Jabe, I think, was at a National Workers Conference in the early 80, mid 80s. And uh, I think I was still in the Navy then. 
But anyway, they, I think it was a setup. They had given me a topic to present and we had the hallway to give it in, a little bitty place, and it was packed. And the topic was a conservative church in a contemporary world. And as I was going in to speak, Jabe was on his way out. I don't know if that meant anything. But anyway, he took me by the arm and he said, good luck, brother. <laughs> it, it was kind of a bloodletting. But anyway, <laughs> baptism of fire. And the first time I preached with Brother Larry, he, like here, he followed me. And uh, like here, they had a clock at the back of the auditorium. And I, I thought I was waxing pretty well. But man... I just preached my little heart out and preached and I preached and preached and, and just like time had stood still. I kept looking at the clock. I look at my watch. I thought, hey, you still got, man, a lot of time. So I preached on and I preached on. Still got time. You know. I preached on and I preached on. Finally, I just said, there's just nothing more to give. And I just closed in prayer and came down. And Larry, Larry stops me and said, hey, thanks for taking all my time. <laughs> the clock had stopped and my watch had stopped too. <laughs> <laughs> so we're mortal enemies ever since. <laughs> well, open to our first verse today. This will be a pretty simple uh, story, simple message. I'm going to have three points. A.P. Gibbs would not be happy. I'm um, going to have three simple points. When I'm done, you probably will be able to quote the verses, and you probably will be able to quote the message. Um, open to Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. You ready? Vernon says, whenever you, Vernon said, when we were discipling, he said, whenever you call out a verse, he said, wait till you quit hearing the pages turning. Then you'll know everybody's there. Okay. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, <clears throat> God. In the beginning, God. Let's pray. Father, uh, please. Hide me behind the cross, behind your blessed son. Let your spirit be the speaker today and our teacher. Uh, move, I pray, a little bit of your heart and mind from these pages into our hearts and our minds. Help us, Father, to take it in and be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, our topic this morning is beginnings. Beginnings. And, you know, almost everything has a beginning. And I say almost because, of course, God has no beginning. He's eternal. He was in the beginning. In the beginning, God. And it's interesting how no matter what you're going to talk about, what you want to tell about a person or a place or a thing or an action or a something, it seems like we always start at the beginning. Um, my bride, my little wife, um, and I, just nine days ago, had our 60th anniversary. When I was a young man, I didn't think people even lived that long, <laughs> much less married that long. And uh, most of it has been, all of it's been a joy for me. And most of it has been a joy for her. Uh, and... Uh, I wanted to bring a little bit, I, I'm not a Facebooker, 
if you see anything on our Facebook, it's not me. I, I'm not a Facebooker. I don't like Facebook. I, I don't even look at Facebook. Uh, Joanne watches it to keep in touch with the grandkids and the great grandkids. And uh, in the process, keeps an eye on all of you guys too. And then she lets me know what he th she thinks I need to know. And beyond that, I'm just happy in my ignorance. But I wanted to put something for 60 years on there to let people know what a great wife I had and what a great woman she was. And so, where to start? Well, at the beginning, right? <laughs> October the 3rd, 1964, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Westminster Presbyterian Church. Her uncle's father was the preacher there, and he married us. October 3rd, I had my little convertible, little blue convertible parked out in front, and it snowed that day. <laughs> Welcome to Minnesota. <laughs> you wonder why I'm not in Minnesota anymore. We almost immediately, with the Navy, moved to Memphis. New Year's Day, 1965, pulled up in Millington, Tennessee for my second tour of duty at a motel there. Uh, the war was just, my war was just getting going and there was nowhere to stay. Men were living in chicken coops in those days. The buildup was going on. Pulled up in a motel, got out of the car to unload the car. It was like 75 degrees. We left in a blizzard. I got out, I told Joanne, I said, I'm not ever going back to Minnesota again. <laughs> well, that was the beginning. And isn't it the same here? We're here to celebrate 50 years, 50 years. You know, it's like a vapor like a vapor. Tre treasure every day you have. It's a gift from God. Treasure every day. Life expectancy for a career military person. I had 25 years in the Navy. Life expectancy for a career military person, according to the insurance people who know these things, is 58 years old. In February, I turn 81. <laughs> That's called cheating the system. That's why they, you know, they wonder why you, how can you pay a person a, a retirement when they're 40 years old? Well, because he's only going to live another 10 years, right? This is a, it's a good investment. Isn't it the same here? Central Bible Chapel, 50 <laughs> years old. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to all you locals. And you know, it's, it, the only, you know, it's only here because you stuck with it. And I know I've been coming here about a lot of years, almost from the beginning. And there's been some wonderful times. And there's been some terrible times. There's been some terrible times. I went to Lake Park Chapel. It was about the only meeting in the Deep South in its day. I've been there when there were 300 people. And I sat there after a huge split and there was Nine of us, nine of us. And I watched Vernon Schleif weep over the work he had done. Good times and bad times both. But you know, it's here because you stuck with it. You know, David, David, there were some men that went to war with David. War is no fun. And there were some that were just so wore out he have to, had to leave them at the river and left him to watch the stuff. And when the soldiers came back from the battle and they divided up the goods, those that stayed with the stuff got a fair share just like the ones that went to battle. It's important to stick with the stuff. Stick with the stuff. Part-time soldiers, dime a dozen. When the battle gets going, 
When the going gets tough, the tough get going, we used to say. Right? Stick with it. Stick with it. The rewards for the stickers are much better than the quitters. Stick with it. Over my nearly 40 years in the Lord's work, I've seen 11 meetings planted, some that I had almost nothing to do with, some that I had almost everything to do with. 11 meetings. Today, there's four of them, and I'm not counting this meeting here. I, uh, this is its own standalone thing. Today, of the 11, there's four that are still going. And those four are still going because somebody stuck with the stuff. At the beginning, especially, it's really hard. But in the beginning, Dave and Patty Leach, they lived for a brief time in Macon, Georgia. And while they were there, they met in the living room uh, with uh, Jimmy and Linda Leaptrot. Uh, Jimmy was the kind of guy that he's an old railroader. Some of you, I'm sure, knew him. And uh, he was an old railroader. And when he smiled, he was, he was kind of round. You just wanted to hug him. And when he smiled, his whole body smiled. He was the, one of the most pleasant people I've ever known in my life. He was a joy to count as a friend. And I don't care how bad the going was, Jimmy Leaptrot always had a smile and a, how you doing? And they met in their living room. And they practiced New Testament principles. It was fairly new to them. And, and it was like a light went on. This is really real. This is really real. And they fell in love with those things. And they were there only for two and a half years. But that two and a half years left an indelible impression on him. On them. In the beginning, in the beginning, on a living room sofa and a bread and a cup and principles from this book that you could take things from this book and just plow them directly into our, our lives. It wasn't some archaic dust covered thing from the past. It was things that was still as good today as it was back there in Jesus' day. Good morning. Welcome. Come in, make yourself at home. Any chair that's open is yours. The ones that have somebody in it, mm, share it. <laughs> <laughs> if they're littler than you. <laughs> Welcome. These were practical things that they learned on that living room sofa. And they were there in that two and a half years long enough to see New Testament principles practiced and become, in the end, Three Oaks Bible Chapel. It grew from a little handful of people into a real church with a real building. And, of course, it was a church when there was just Jimmy and Linda, right? The church is the people, not the building. But it's nice to have a building, those of us that went through Katrina know what it's like not to have a building. <laughs> a little side note. <laughs> Some people right now are going through a real tough time, too. Keep them in prayer. Well, anyway, two and a half years made a big difference on Dave and Patty Leach. And after two and a half years, um, everything changed on June 1st, 1974 when they moved from Macon, Georgia, to Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, it's a different world over here. But those principles are the same. You can talk to missionaries in Angola, like Mr. Wilson, T. Ernest Wilson, and he'll tell you the principles were the same in the bush. They loved those principles. They loved the idea of the biblical pattern, taking what the scripture says and actually doing it. Can you imagine that? Actually doing it. The centrality of Christ. The 
the priority of a weekly gathering for fellowship around the Lord Jesus to remember him in the bread and the cup. I, I think he asked us to do that, didn't he? he I, let me see. How did it, how's that verse go? On the fifth Sunday of the month, when the disciples came. No, 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 it wasn't that. It wasn't that. Uh, one, how did that go? One, once a month, if the weather is good, when the disciples came together for Brother Brown's preaching, we, we, if we have time, we'll set aside five minutes at the end for breaking bread. No, no, no. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together for what? To break bread. Paul was there. Paul was there. He saw it. He recorded it. And he brought it to the Gentiles. That's most of us. South Alabama, probably all of us, maybe, huh? On the first day of the week, when the, when the disciples came together to break bread. Oh, by the way, Paul preached to them. The kid fell out of the window. You know how the story goes. It was the priority of their... These are slaves. A lot of talk about slavery these days, right? U.S. is the number one slave trading country in the world today. Right? Sex trafficking. And when they use them up then they cut their body parts out and throw them away. These were slaves. They couldn't take the Sabbath off and tell your boss, eh, sorry boss, we're, we're going to go down here with the believers and, and we're going to break bread today on Saturday, the Sabbath, right? Uh, uh, the boss would say, what? Yeah, yeah. Bend over this pole over here. I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. But on the first day, Sunday, the Lord's Day. Good morning, brother. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached. We, we've, got a, we've got a church in our town. They've, they've got communion to go. I don't know, maybe some of you are in one of these. I don't know. If, if so, I'll apologize before I even get started. But anyway, I don't know how this works. But at the beginning of the meeting, the preacher will say, now this is Communion Sunday. So um, during the break, you can come up to the table up here. There's a, a fellowship hall table set up here. And a pile of these little self-contained communion cups, right, with the juice in the bottom and the little wafer in the top. That's a pretty neat invention. I've been to chapels where they use those, and, and, it's, and it's pretty good and pretty neat. But it's not like get it because then we're going to have communion. It's like pick it up on your way out, and then what, <laughs> what do I do with it? <laughs> we go in the parking lot, and, you know, or, or maybe we wait for a red light, and we stop, and we pull this thing apart, and, <laughs> and your wife says, Bob, get driving. We have for crying out loud, you know. Put the communion cup in the ashtray. We'll get it later. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Oh, by the way, Paul preached, and he preached a long time. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them. He said, now listen. This is my body, broken for you. As often as you take this bread, it's like remembering me. You know, you'll remember me. Now, you know, there's some folks, and they're, and they're good folks, I'm sure, but they think that somehow the church I came out of, well, no, 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 anyway, I'll get there. They think that somehow that that piece of bread becomes literally the body of Christ, you know. So when you take it, you're taking the body of Christ. The church I grew up in, they didn't believe that. They were a splinter from that group. And they, they believed that somehow it was just bread until you took it, and then it, then it became the body of Christ. I don't know if I'm really into this that much, right? And, I, you know, as a kid, I always thought, 
I wonder if you just left it on the counter, what would happen to it, you know? No, it's like, you know, I pull out my, used to say my wallet, now I pull out my phone, and I pull up this picture. Oh, there, there. You see that picture? That's my wife. And you say, how did, you get, how did he get her in that little box? Right? <laughs> it's not her. When I say, that's Joanne, I'm saying, that's a, that's a representation of her. Right? And that's what Jesus did that night. You see this bread? It's me. It's a picture of me. I'm going to be broken just like this bread. And the cup, that's my blood. And unless you eat the bread and Drink the cup, you've got no part in me. In other words, if you don't take me in, you've got no part in me. You see, in the beginning, these things were really important. You have to, you got the weeping prophet on your hands, so <laughs> bear with me if I go off a little bit. I'll, I'll be back, you know. You see, not long, and they're going to see that man hanging on a cross. For you, for me. Because he could look down, not like us, he could look down through the tunnel of time and see you, and see me, and know what a rat scallion you were and I was. <laughs> That's why I had to tell people what a good wife I had. Put up with a sailor for 25 years. You can, if I say sailor, you get this automatic picture in your mind, you know. <laughs> It's not too far from wrong. They could see little Bobby Brown in an orphanage in South St. Paul. He needed a savior. They could see big Bobby Brown as a sailor just misbehaving the stew out of things. And he needed a savior. And, and he could see Joanne Pettis Brown putting up with that. And she needed a savior. And he could look down the tunnel of time and see each one of you. And he loved you. And you needed a savior. And he was just the right size and shape for that. He had a job to do, and there wasn't anything turning him aside. Because in the beginning, he loved you. And that's what Central Bible Chapel is about. in the beginning. They love the pattern. They love the centrality of Christ. They love the priority of the weekly remembrance of the Lord Jesus. They love the believers praying as though they really believed God would answer them. Can you believe that? They did. They did. And you know, when you really believe, he answers. And that's pretty amazing. I can remember... And you can, my fellow elder back here, Lee Sanford, I can remember like it was yesterday, we had a teacher in our school whose daughter had this incurable disease, cystic fibrosis. <laughs> I got a memory like a trap, it's mostly rusty. <clears throat> cystic fibrosis. And we were in a prayer meeting, and one of the men, one of the men stood up and said something like, God, you're a prayer answering God, and a miracle is nothing for you to do. And there's a little girl in the school next door, and she needs this cystic fibrosis taken out of her body. And I think the next week, or a very short time, mom took her into the doctor for her regular visit. And the doctor was gone out for quite a while and came back in, and he said, I don't understand this. There must have been a misdiagnosis. Now I'm telling you, the little girl didn't need Lee to put his hands on her or me to put our hands on her or her to kick her in the backside. All she needed was the God of the universe to come down and meddle in her little life. And her mom's a believer and she's a believer. That's the kind of God we've got. And in the beginning, David and Patty saw this. This isn't just going to church. This is going to meeting. And we go and we meet with the God of the universe. 
and it's it's really good, and it's really good. The meeting where Joanne and I were saved, a bunch of Mennonite dairy farmers up in Pennsylvania, and I'm a sailor. I grew up in the church, I choir boy, altar boy. I didn't want to have any part of this. My friend flew helicopters together, and he he said, "You got to go to this church. This this guy." Tom Taylor, and, and he's really funny. You'll enjoy his ministry. Just come. I said, listen, I don't, I don't wear a suit. It's T-shirt, Bermudas, sneakers. That's it. He said, I don't care if you come in your underwear. Just come, and nobody will say a word. So I got my suit out, and I came. Here's these dairy farmers. You know, I don't know if you know dairy farmers, but they got hands like hams. They've been working all their lives, you know. And when they hold a, a big... Schofield wide margin Bible, you know, it's like a like a pocket Bible in their hands. You know? And they'd stand up in in the meeting and they'd weep. They'd weep over this man that they called Lord. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I'd like to have a part in that. That's the kind of that's the kind of thing I'd like to have a part in. And that's where Central Bible Chapel began, in the beginning. And they looked, when they came to Montgomery, they looked for the same thing in Montgomery. And they found it. They're meeting up in Birmingham, 80 miles away, and meeting over in Galleon, 80 miles away. And, you know, I in my boldness i'd have said we'll drive 80 miles you know well, it's pretty far when you got wife and two little kids or three little kids sunday school was little scotty little richie pat and uh, it's pretty far well you know what are we going to do then hmm. Hmm. well you know they'd seen god answer prayer so they thought, well, let's pray. Let's pray. So look, look at, I didn't finish that verse. In the beginning, God. Right? It's not in the beginning, Bob, or the meeting, or the car, my Hyundai. In the beginning, God. Unseen, the God of the universe has been working behind David and Patty Leach all the time. Of course, they didn't see him. They didn't see him put them on that living room sofa, and they didn't see him watch that new building be populated. They didn't see him as he taught them these principles sitting on the sofa. In the beginning, God. And I hope you know him today. You know, anytime you get a group of people like this together, I don't know you all. I, I hope I will. Saddle up next to me sometime over coffee. Look for the coffee. I'll be there. Um, so I don't know if everybody here is what we call saved. Or the Lord would say, the Lord said to a religious preacher, Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. It, it, it's a, it, if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to be born again. In the big church where I grew up, I was a choir boy, an altar boy, never heard those terms. We talked about, you know, maybe going to heaven, but you could lose it if you didn't behave. They never taught about how you get it back. That was a mystery. If you don't have God in your life, you're missing out on the cherry of the ice cream sundae. It's the best part of life. And you get God in your life by having his son in your life, the Lord Jesus. He that has the son has the father. If you don't have the son, you don't have the father either. Talk to a lot of people with really messed up lives, and they want those lives straightened out, but they don't want to hear about this religious stuff. So, well, it isn't religious. I'm not a religious person. I'm a believer. Right? Religion can't do anything for you. But God can. And the only way to know him is to know his son. And if you're here today and you haven't met him, 
please, let today, I'll, I'll talk to you. I know what it's like, right? If there's a sin, I've probably done it, I'm sorry, in my old life. I know exactly where you are. And Larry was worse than me, man. And he wasn't even a sailor. And Jabe, he was hidden up in Canada, so nobody knows what he was doing. <laughs> in the beginning, God, remembering their experience in Macon, they thought, if we only had something like that here. And soon, they made contact with three other couples. <laughs> what a coincidence, huh? See, there are none. We've got a big God, and he worked... You know, if you were a God who had no lips, how would you communicate, right, through circumstance? You don't want me going down this path? You'd put hindrances in my way. And if you're stupid enough, like I was, I crawled over those hindrances a bunch of times. And then he puts bigger ones there and bigger ones and bigger ones. And he might just strike you down. Get your attention. Jesus said, you must be born again. God so loved, and you can put your name in here. God so loved the world, John 3, 16. For a long time, you know, I'd watch a ball game and people would hold these signs up. JN.3 colon 16. JN.3 colon 16. And I thought, what in the world does that mean? JN3 colon. Until somebody showed me in the Bible, you know, it's John 3, 16. Oh, oh. I was a choir boy. I was an altar boy. Right? A lot of good that did. Right? Well, you look that up, and what does it say? It says God loves you. God's lo and not just that he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son that if you just believe in him, simple as that. You don't have to know the Bible. You don't have to, you don't have to know dip. Just believe. Believe he can do it. He'll save you. You'll have everlasting life. When does everlasting start? That's a question. In Louisiana, when you ask the question, you always answer it. So, Okay, when does everlasting start? Right now, right? I got it. If I have an everlasting life, I have it right now. I don't have to wait for it. I don't have to join the church for it. I don't have to go somewhere on a pilgrimage for it. I have it the minute I ask for it. Why would I ask for it? Because I need it. I'm unhappy where I am. I don't like this. I wasn't an alcoholic. I just liked to drink. Right? And I could quit, you know, half a dozen times a week. Right? Not an alcoholic. God loves you so much, he gave his son. That if you just believe in him, just believe, you'd have everlasting life. Well, they remembered, they prayed, and God actually answered, brought three couples into their lives. And they began meeting regularly Sunday evenings in Montgomery, Alabama, in their home. But you know, as it grows, you're faced with questions. And the, the people would ask. And, and they had to come up with some answers. And so that brings us to our second verse. You've got this verse memorized, right? I told you, you're going to know all the three verses. You'll know all the three minutes. Okay, second verse, John, the Gospel of John. Wait for the pages to quit turning around. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1, John 1, 1. Let's read this one. Still pages. Some of us are slower than others. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, there we are, was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And you know what? This is a word that speaks to us. If we'll listen, all right. All right. 
my radio didn't work. I never got anything out of it until I figured out I hadn't turned it on. Right? God speaks if we listen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now watch this, careful. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Oh, by the way, that includes the church, right? He, he made the church. It's his body. It's his body. It's not Pastor Johnson's body. It's not Pastor Johnson's church. It's not Deacon Smith's church. Always amazes me whose name is on the sign out in front. Right. Ought to be the Lord Jesus, right? It's his church. It's not Elder Scott or Elder Bob or Elder Lee or Elder James or Elder Paul. It's not our church. It's his church. It's the body of Christ. It's precious. You know, we might abuse lots of things, but we take good care of our little bodies. You don't need to turn to it, but you can mark it in your memory. Colossians 1.18 says, And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, the Lord Jesus, might have the preeminence. Okay, I'm going to stop preaching for just a minute and meddle for a minute. Right? How is that in your life? Is the Lord Jesus preeminent in your life? Because, see, in the beginning, God. And in the beginning was the Word, the Lord Jesus. And he wants to be preeminent in our lives. That means, number one, he needs to be more important to me than my little bride down here. And she's awful important to me. When our squadron would deploy, first thing I did when I got where I was going, I got my little locker and I opened it up and I put her picture on the inside of the locker door. <clears throat> And then I had a chain of, uh, I brought a pack of um, paper clip, thank you. This is my, my uh, teleprompter. <laughs> a pack of paper clips. And however long we were going to be gone, I'd count up those days and I'd hook those together until I had this long chain of paper clips. And every day when I'd get up in the morning, I'd go to my locker, open it up, get my toilet kit out, and I'd take a clip off of that list. And I could see the days getting shorter, getting shorter. And when we'd come back and the airplane would land, there was a whole airplane full of little noses pressed against the door, a window, I'm sorry, against the window, looking to see if that special person was out on the flight line, waiting for that plane to come home. Some didn't come home. Some didn't come home. She's precious. But if Jesus isn't more precious to me than her, I'll never be the husband to her that I should be. And if Jesus isn't the primary person in her life, she'll never be the wife that she should be to me. He wants to be preeminent. That means before the eminent. You have to figure that out yourself. Right? He wants to be tops. He, he should come before your spouse, should come before your kids, come before you. Now, now I'm going to get meddling here in my own life. Come before your grandkids <clears throat> and your great grandkids. And listen, if you don't have them, grandkids become great. <laughs> great grandkids. He should become before your golf game. I was, I was not only a sailor in my career, I was a sailor as a, as a hobby, I must. I'm a licensed yacht captain. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. You know when the 
when the sailing regattas are always on Sunday. Always. Always. You know when the golf matches are? Sunday. Always. Always. You see, the devil wants to attract us away from what's really important with our lives because if we get away from him, everything else is going to go by the boards. I'll tell you what, if, if my sailing became more important to me than the Lord, and there was a big temptation in that, mm, I'll tell you. Mm. And I watch, I watch the Admiral's Cup every year, and I think, oh, it looks like a lot of fun out there on the water. You know? It's Sunday. Maybe, I could, maybe this one Sunday I could just stay home. And I could watch that sailing man. I, listen, shh, don't tell Lee. I'll just tell him I'm sick. Right? I'm just not, I wouldn't say sick. I'd just say, I'm, I'm just not feeling up to it today, right? You know? Yeah, you smile knowingly, right? He needs to be number one. He's more important than all of these things. He's the head of the church. Is he really the head of me? Is he more important to me than my job? And I know things come up, you know, it's inventory time, blah, 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 blah. Little girl came to me. We led her to the Lord. And she said, Mr. Bob, she said, I just can't come on, on Wednesday nights <clears throat> because I've got to work. I said, no, you don't have to work. I mean, you have to die, right? It's the only half to you got. <clears throat> well, I've just got to work. If I, if, I, if I even ask for the time off, I'll get fired. <clears throat> I said, no, you won't. She said, yes, I will. He's that kind of a person. I said, well, you know, prayer is really important. You know, if you had cancer, you would like the prayer, everybody to be at the prayer meeting praying for you, right? You wouldn't like somebody to stay home and say, well, I'm just not feeling up to it today, you know? No, no, you want everybody at the prayer meeting because there's power in group prayer. She said, well, I, you know, I said, listen, where do you work? She said, I'm a greeter at Walmart. Well, I know, that's pretty irreplaceable. High pay. Probably couldn't get another job from that job. But listen, I'll tell you what, you ask for the time off. And if he fires you, I'll trust the Lord to give me enough money to pay your salary until you find another job. She wasn't convinced. But she went away kind of scratching her head. Did anybody make that kind of an offer? <clears throat> and... Come Sunday, I see her across the auditorium, and she said, Mr. Bob, Mr. Bob, she runs across the auditorium. She said, you'll never believe what happened. No, I won't, you know. Who could imagine? She said, I went and I asked the time off, and he said, you know what? Oh, she, I said, tell him you're a Christian, and the meetings are important to you, and you just like to have time off for prayer. She said, I told him just that, and she said, he said, you know, I've been looking for somebody that's honest. And if you're honest enough to tell me that, you're honest enough. To, I'm looking for somebody to honestly make out the schedule each week. She said, I'm in charge of the schedule. I can take any day off I want to take off. See, God's bigger than a bread box, you know. These are real things. And I see people, you know, oh, you know, I can't do this because I got this. Oh, you know, I can't do that. Come on. You're a, you're a child of the God of the universe, right? In the beginning, God. And in the beginning was the word. And it's his church. And you're his child. And he's promised to do this. Hmm. Well, over the next six years, the meeting grew. It practiced these principles. Believers coming together around the Lord Jesus no name to indicate that this building is the church, because we're the church. The people are the church. No name on the sign. It's the Central Bible Chapel, where a group of Christians meet. I'm not here to argue with you about names, but words mean something. Words are important. And every week they met for prayer, and they saw God answer prayer. Because if you had the faith of a mustard seed, he could say to that mountain, get, get out of there, go over in the sea, and he would. I haven't gotten to that point yet. I wish I'd had, but I, I'm not. But he answers faith, and the prayer meeting is really important. How are you going to know the problems that your, your brothers and sisters have if you don't come to prayer meeting? Right? And this isn't a gossip session. 
But it's, it's people that are opening their heart and saying, listen, I really need prayer. My kid is doing this, or my grandkid's doing that, or my wife's got a bunion, or, you know, whatever the case may be. I need God's help on this. And if you're not there, you, can't, you, don't, you don't know what's going on. So it's a time to come. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. It's the time to come together. because Why? Because we're a family. We care about each other. Well, it grew. They met in the living room. Now the, the uh, leeches moved to Millbrook down here on Rose Hill Court. They met there for a little while. And um, the leeches, too, Scott and Kathy in 1985 moved to town. And uh, they had two little girls, and Sarah was in the oven. She was not born yet. And uh, they incorporated as, a Louisiana, as an Alabama 501c3 corporation and uh, decided they needed a building. They, bought, they rented a building right around the corner down here on Edgewood Road. And they met there for quite a while. And the burden was to have a building of their own. You know, it's, it's better to own it than to rent it. And so they looked, and Scott would look, and he'd hunt, and he'd hunt, and he'd hunt. And I'd come up, and we'd hunt together, and we'd look together. We, I, I don't know how many places we've looked at, but it was a ton of them, ton of them. And they just didn't seem to go right, you know? And then, then one day he called me up. He said, Bob, you wouldn't believe the place. We found a flower shop down in the corner, right kitty corner from the park. And the guy's going out of business. I'll tell you what, God made this building for Central Bible Chapel. God made this building. The flower shop owner opened the flower shop and went out of business, and here it was. Who wants to buy a flower shop? Nobody I know. Well, there is this little local group of believers that's looking for a place. Perfect. Perfect. Look, let's, one more verse, real quick. First John 1. Where do you suppose? First John 1 John 1.1. They bought the building. <clears throat> that which was from the beginning. First John 1 John 1.1. 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Listen to this now. Don't you feel the intimacy in this? This is like, this is like John has, and, and he did. You know, he was the youngest of the, of the brethren. He was the one who leaned on the Lord's breast in the upper room that night. He's a young man. And I can just picture young John leaning on the Lord, and he's just snuggled up to him, right? Oh, Lord, I love you so much. You are so fantastic. And here he's telling about it. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, which we've looked upon, we've studied him, which our hands have handled. It's the word of life. It's the Listen, you listen to this word, you're going to have life, brother, sister. It's the living word. It's the word of life. It's the eternal word of life. And that life was manifested, was made visible. And we've seen it. And we bear witness to it. And we're showing it to you. Don't you want to have a part in it, John says? Right? I don't want to, I don't want to go to the 5,000-man cathedral where you know four people, the four that sit right next to you on a Sunday, right? I don't want to go to the, how, you know, I'm sorry, meddling again, you know. But it's so small. Well, of course it's small, right? Which do you think? Where do you want your kids to go to school? In a, in a school that has a classroom with 10 or in a school that has a classroom of 40? That's a question. Classroom of 10, right? You'd have to be an idiot not to do that, right? Well, nobody here, of course, but 
There, there are some. Where would you like to get your car serviced? In a gas station that has one waiting or in a gas station that's got 10 waiting? One. Run. Where would you like to go to um, a nice evening together with four people or with 40 people? Four. Right? We know. Okay, where do you want to go to church? In this group with 20 or with this group with 5,000? 5, 5,000, right? It's the successful place. No, it's not. No, it's not. If you're lucky, you make an appointment to see the pastor. Maybe you'll see his assistant next Friday in three months or something, you know? I'm not picking on that, but I am saying that size is not necessarily an indication of success. And over the years, this meeting has snuggled up to the Lord. They've heard him. They've seen him with their eyes. They've looked upon him. They've handled him. It's the word of life. A little group of people can snuggle up really good to the Lord. And when, you, and when you've got a, a prayer meeting and somebody's got a daughter that's maybe going to live till she's 50, the big church doesn't even know about her. But the little church, somebody will have the audacity to stand up publicly where people will hear them and say, Lord, we've got to have a miracle here. We've got to have this little girl cured. It's impossible yeah, for us. Nothing impossible for our God. And he doesn't need Bobby Brown to put his hands on him. He doesn't need uh, Lee Sandifer to talk some kind of gobblish over him, over her. Just needs the Lord Jesus to take her under his wing and love her free of cancer. Look at the end of that. For the life was manifest, and we've seen it, and we bear witness, and show it to you, that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto you. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And with his Son, Jesus Christ. Here's the, the point of it all. These things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. You want to have a full, contented, joyful life, no matter what the circumstance. I'd rather die under the bridge, under a bridge with cancer and Jesus, than to live in a palace without him. All right? He's the answer to every problem that everyone has. Carl Knott, a friend of ours for a long time, uh, came to Slidell to see what it was like to work with people like we work with and uh, on his way to Spain. And I said, Carl, you can help me. I, I said, every morning I get up and I say, Lord, please take, bring me to the person that I can share the gospel with. And every day I come home and I haven't done it. And he looked at me like I was a frog. And he said, well, <laughs> what do you expect? Expect him to flop down on the sidewalk in front of you and ask you to get saved? Well, I, I kind of did, I guess, you know. I wouldn't say it, but I, I guess so. He said, well, <laughs> listen, you pray that prayer. That's a good prayer to pray. And then when you go out, you assume that everybody you come in contact with that day is the answer to that prayer. You're driving down the road. You look down. I need gas. Oh, well, where should I get it? I don't know. Let's go in here to the shell station. Pull in the shell station. Don't pay at the pump. Pay inside. It's not a coincidence that that girl happens to be on the counter that day. And I, I don't care. You don't have to be a great wizard to just say, by the way, this is John Burley's line. He said, did you get one of these? And the inference, of course, is everybody's got one except you, right? Did you get one of these? The, the, um, listen, try me out. 
did you get one of these? They'll always say, no, I didn't. Well, here, this is yours. You can, everybody can do that. You don't have to be a great theological scholar, right? God loves people. God loves you. And Central Bible Chapel has become what it is because they know the Lord Jesus and they know the word of God and they know that he loves them. And so they love others for him. Father, bless your word, we pray. Um, I know I've gone over, I'm sorry, as usual. Bless your word, I pray. Bless each one who's come out today and uh, just make yourself uh, so obvious in each life that they, they, they can't they can't not notice you sitting in the car next to them. So bless, we pray this weekend in Jesus' name. Amen.